Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming here this evening. Um, my name is Angela Giles, and I'll be your co MC this evening with Marion. Um, I'm the Atlantic Regional Organizer with the Council of Canadians. And I'm Marion Moore. I'm with the Social Chapter of the Council of Canadians and also with the Campaign to Protect Offshore Nova Scotia. Um, so at first, I would like to introduce uh, and invite Elder Billy Lewis to the stage. Um, we are organizing on unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation, so it's important to recognize this. Sorry, unceded ancestral territory <laughs> <laughs> of the Mi'kmaq Nation. So uh, welcome, <clears throat> Billy. Yeah, and the, the reason for that is not just a formality because all the things that we're talking about tonight and that the people will be, be presenting, and I'm really looking forward to it, is it's the whole eastern seaboard that's affected. So it's not just the Mi'kmaq, but the Abenaki people from the whole area, all the people of the Don, and the, and the local people are affected by this. That's why I'm glad that this is happening today. And we'd just like to, uh, to welcome everyone to Mi'kma'ki, the territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And let's, uh, let's put our minds together, open up our hearts, and listen to what's being presented. Because, uh, well, it's just a personal thing. I really think we're at that point where we have to decide either to take a stand or stand aside because all these things affect every single one of us and that's uh, that's why I'm wearing my t-shirt today along with my medicine pouch that I spilled half my supper on last night <laughs> <laughs> so we're uh, we're uh, we really sh should take into account everything that's being said tonight. And like I say, I'm really looking forward to it and I hope that everyone who walks away from here talks to another dozen people that can to carry that message further and further because there's no bigger threat than what's being proposed right now for the offshore. Well, Alio, thank you. Um, so I'm very excited for this evening. I have to say the Council of Canadians and the Campaign to Protect Offshore Nova Scotia, or CPONS as it's known, um, which is a project of the South Shore chapter of the Council of Canadians, have been working together for weeks leading up to tonight to bring you this event and to be part of uh, a tour this week along the South Shore to raise awareness. So as many of you have likely heard just a few weeks ago, Environment and Climate Change Minister uh, Catherine McKenna approved a BP, also known as uh, British Petroleum, um, project proposal, which is to drill up to seven wells as deep as twice the depth of the Mikado, Mikando well that led to the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, which I'm sure you all remember from 2010. So BP has been approved um, to drill these wells as soon as this spring, which is today, happy spring. Um, and uh, they, they're planning to do one this spring. Um, the CNS OPB, which is the, the Canada Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board, still needs to give the final approval before they can go ahead, but they have already received that federal, federal government approval. So as you can see from this map, the lease area is uh, between 230 and 370 kilometers offshore Nova Scotia, and the deepest uh, lease is over 3,000 meters deep. So, in relation to this project, um, consultation has been severely lacking. The Canada Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board and industry players have had a lot of access to the process and uh, have approved this project while community organizations have not been involved. As well, consultation with indigenous people has, peoples have been uh, limited to ban governments and their representatives, um, Indian Act chiefs essentially, 
um, or CAMK, which Michelle will, will speak more about, but it has not included the grassroots people of the Mi'kmaq Nation. So this tour was born from the desire to raise awareness about this industry, and to do so we wanted to bring together people who are knowledgeable about the risks of offshore drilling. We believe that this is really pertinent information for us to have before industry starts here. The Council of Canadians believes offshore drilling is not worth the risk to our communities, fisheries, water, and climate. That is our position that we've been working with sea ponds to support the wonderful work they've been engaged with on a community level, asking hard questions of the risks, on the risks of offshore drilling and why communities haven't been adequately consulted to date. I should say that while this is our position at the Council of Canadians, we want to state clearly that each panelist here tonight is independent to the Council and has joined this tour to ask the question of whether offshore drilling is worth the risk to Nova Scotia. They will speak to their own research and experience. Um, and I'll just show you, this is the map that was included in the <coughs> environmental assessment that BP provided to, um, to the federal government. Um, so just a few quick details uh, before we proceed. Um, the bathrooms are just out the door and to the right through, through uh, another door there. Um, and then you'll find them on your left hand side. The format for this evening is going to be um, the, the panelists speaking. Um, Antonia we've uh, invited to speak for about 20 minutes and then both Michelle and Colin will speak for approximately 10 and then we'll have uh, a good chunk of time to do question and answer at the end. Um, I should also mention that we're live streaming the event uh, so if you want to share with your friends or what have you it is available on Facebook and just a quick reminder to turn off your cell phones if you have not already done so. Thanks. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, who we're so glad was able to join us here today. Antonia Juhas has, is a leading energy analyst, author, and investigative journalist specializing in oil. She's an award-winning writer. Her articles appear in Newsweek, Rolling Stone, Harper's Magazine, The Atlantic, CNN.com, The Nation, Miss, The Advocate, and many more. She is the author of Black Tide, the devastating impact of the Gulf oil spill, which was uh, released by Wiley in 2011. And it is a searing look on the human face of BP's disaster um, in the Gulf. An in-depth in investigation into the causes and consequences of the largest offshore drilling oil spill in world history. So Antonia, will you come on up? Thank you. Thank you. While we're doing that, you could start the yeah. slideshow without the sound, please. This one? It's um, no, Nova Scotia BP, no sound. Mm -hmm. It just has the weird Apple soundtrack, which I'm not interested in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is it not set up to do it after all that? You want to come up and do it? I think you got it. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, just turn it off. Just let it run. I think I can reach this way.
We can turn the lights back on now. So that was, um, first I wanna thank you all for being here tonight and thank you for having me here. How's the sound? Good, Good great. Um, I just arrived from San Francisco last night, um, so uh, your weather is more beautiful than my weather right now, so it's really <laughs> nice to be here um, and wonderful to be invited to speak with you about what I've learned on my investigations. So I began investigating the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster basically right when it began, which is nearly eight years ago now. Um, I didn't plan to devote so much of my life um, to this disaster, to offshore drilling, um, to oil, but BP set that in motion for me. Um, and as was said in the introduction by Angela, I've written dozens of articles. I keep returning to the Gulf to cover this story. Um, and I wrote this book, um, Black Tide, The Devastating Impact of the Gulf Oil Spill. And I think I'll just start um, with reading from the book. I um, you know, sort of ironically enjoyed writing this book because I got to learn and spend so much time with the, about the places and with the people of the US Gulf of Mexico. Um, I will admit being a San Franciscan who has lived, grew up in Colorado, but lived on the East Coast, lived on the West Coast, I did not know the Gulf Coast of the United States until I was introduced to it by this uh, disaster. And it is a place of unbelievably stunning beauty and rich in um, diversity and, um, but I had experience after experience after experience of showing up on a gorgeous seashore and forgetting for a split second while I was there until I would look down and see the oil uh, in, in front of me on the beach. And um, so it was a, a, a wonderful way to be introduced to a, a heartbreaking, a wonderful way to be introduced to a beautiful part of the United States through a heartbreaking introduction. And I spent a lot of time interviewing um, the family members of the 11 men who died aboard the Deepwater Horizon, uh, workers who were, worked on the rig, fishers, fisher folk, um, Native Americans, environmentalists, elected officials, oil company executives. Um, but I open my book um, with a quote from one of the men who worked on the Deepwater Horizon who was on the rig uh, that night of the explosion. And his name is Stephen Lane Stone. He, uh, is a Transocean roustabout, and Transocean is the company that was running the BP Deepwater Horizon rig. So he says, this event was set in motion, and sorry, this is testimony that he provided to Congress in 2010, after the explosion. This event was set in motion years ago by these companies needlessly rushing to make money faster while cutting corners to save money. When these companies put their savings over our safety, they gambled with our lives. They gambled with my life. They gambled with the lives of 11 of my crew members who will never see their families or loved ones again. The images that I showed you, some of you in the audience may recognize that they're not all Deepwater Horizon. I mixed in many other more recent events. One much older from the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. There was a massive oil spill off the coast of Santa Barbara in 1969. It led to a movement in California to ban offshore drilling that then spread across the United States, such that moratoriums were put in place for new offshore drilling off the Pacific coast, off the Atlantic coast. There was some offshore drilling grandfathered in off the coast of California, and, but the Gulf of Mexico became the primary spot where drilling continued in the United States with an exception made for Florida, uh, the whole state of Florida, um, and some drilling in Alaska. Um, the black and white photo you may have noticed is the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill, but many of those other photographs were from a much more recent Santa Barbara oil spill that happened just a couple years ago, and I included that one, and I'll mention the other ones I included, to demonstrate that it's not just catastrophic events that lead to problems for coastal communities for offshore drilling or people who work on the rigs or are concerned about the rigs. There's problems that happened all along the chain of events. So the most recent Santa Barbara oil spill from which many of those images are from was Exxon was drilling offshore 
the, an oil pipeline carried the oil to shore, an oil pipeline was then running along the coast, and that oil pipeline sprung a leak. And no one noticed that the oil pipeline had sprung a leak until somebody stumbled upon the oil spill. And a massive spill erupted leading to many of those beach images that you saw. Also one of those images that you saw was just less than two years ago, the largest offshore drilling oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico since the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster took place. That was a shell oil rig. And what happened was it was producing oil. There was a pipeline connecting the well to a larger facility. Shell noticed back in 2014 that something weird happened. The pipeline got sand on top of it. And other drilling parts that started to bury a pipeline that wasn't supposed to be built, uh, wasn't supposed to be buried. It turned out that over the years that pressure sprung a leak in that pipe. So about two years ago, two guys were the main guys on the crew. Between the two of them, they had less than two years of experience. They noticed a drop in pressure in the pipeline. But they didn't know what to look for because as it turned out, they hadn't been trained to look for the problem. The problem was this hole in the pipe. They checked this, they checked that, they checked the other thing. Couldn't find the problem, so they sent a helicopter to fly over, and the helicopter, so there's nothing with the equipment that noticed the leak. A helicopter flew over, saw a huge oil sheen across the Gulf of Mexico, and then they found out there was a problem. In the interim, 90,000 gallons of oil leaked into the Gulf of Mexico. And then they figured out that there was a problem. That was one of those images. Another one of those images is the Sanchi oil tanker. That was an explosion that just took place in those biggest explosion pictures in the East China Sea. An Iranian oil tanker carrying condensate oil, which is a very light uh, oil, ran into a Chinese grain tanker and exploded and has led to the largest condensate oil spill ever and one of the largest um, oil tanker spills in a very long time. Of the many experiences that I had covering the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster, one of the more, I, I would say the most moving um, and, and difficult was interviews with um, the survivors, but one of the more profound experiences that I personally had, and excuse me, with the family members of those who passed away on the rig and the survivors who survived the rig, uh, was I spent two weeks on a research vessel in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, with Dr. Samantha Joy, who was the lead scientist. And we took the Alvin submarine to the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, and we got the closest of anyone other than BP to the site of the BP oil spill. And the most important thing that we saw was the nothing. It was a moonscape where there should have been sea life. And what Dr. Joy's research that she conducted there and that she'd been conducting for years after the spill showed, and this was um, two years after the oil spill, was we were taking core samples from this empty moonscape. And what the empty moonscape showed her first was that the sea life that could, could get away from the oil got away from the oil. That that couldn't was buried in the oil, and everything else tried to stay away. And what her sample showed was a two inch thick in places blanket of oil on the bottom of the ocean floor. And that 30 million gallons from the BP oil spill remain on the ocean floor. And because the ocean floor is cold and dark, and a perfect refrigerator, the chances are that it could be there forever. Now, the way it got, one of the ways that it got there, and one of the worrying things about it, is that there were a lot of reports about, about we called the mighty microbes that could. The mighty Macondo microbes that could. So this was the Macondo oil well. It was the BP Deepwater Horizon rig that was drilling. I guess to bring, go back to the basics, April 10th, 2010, there's a blowout in the Macondo well. I'll explain some of the reasons why it happened. Five million gallons of oil spill. The spill goes on for three months. 
It takes 152 days, however, for the hole to be permanently closed in. So it took three months to put a cap on it. And that's the capping stack, which we'll hear more about. It took three months to make that happen, during which the oil was flowing. And one of those images you saw was the spill cam footage. So this is something that we all live through every single day in the United States. There'd be a little camera, little image in the bottom of the TV screen all the time was a spill cam. And this was the image of the oil flowing, bursting out of the well. And the other thing that we would see every day in the Gulf Coast in the news was the oil, the oil cast. So it was the oil forecast for the day. So just like you have a weather cast, or the, what's the rain going to be, what's the storm going to be, we had an oil cast, which was where is the oil going to hit that day so that you could prepare for it. So you had your spill cam and you had your oil cast. So this, the oil uh, gets released and one of the stories that comes out is that don't worry about it because these microbes naturally occurring microbes are going to eat it all so there were some mighty micro mighty macondo microbes that worked really hard doing little things to chomp on the oil because they do there are naturally occurring microbes that chew on oil and eat it the thing is one thing nothing like this had ever happened before this is the largest offshore drilling oil spill in world history a mass immediate eruption of oil it's way more than these little mighty microbes could handle. The other piece, though, is that what the microbes were eating is what they could digest. What they didn't want to digest is the most toxic parts of the oil. That they excreted out. What is left is both the oil that, what, that just settled to the bottom, and then it's, the, it's the, what um, Dr. Samantha Joy affectionately, affectionately calls the microbial snot highway. <laughs> so the Top, most toxic parts travel down on the microbes mucus to rest on the bottom of the ocean. So the most toxic parts are, what there, are what's there. What that means, and also that there is other oil that remains, um, some describe it as a, um, a sort of, when you get out of the bathtub, there's a circle there can be around the edge, that there's an oil bathtub circle. There's oil on the bottom. There's also oil that, of course, had been floating around. You saw those were many of those images. And those have been consumed by critters. And the critters are eating the most toxic parts of the oil. It's been shown that it is being consumed by phytoplankton. It's being consumed by the worms. It's being consumed by the species that eats the worm. It's consumed by the species above that. And it's leading to ingestion across the food chain. And one of the last photos you saw was a photo that I was just sent from the Gulf Restoration Network, which was the dead sperm whale on the beach. These landings, I'm told, have not occurred previously in the Gulf of Mexico. And what they are very concerned about is that the whale at the top of the, at the, top of the food chain is demonstrating a weakness of the entire food chain. So let me read just, um, I just got an update um, from the National Ocean Atmospheric Administration, NOAA in the United States, which counts um, fish counts. And this is, I got the most up-to-date information from them yesterday on fish counts from the Gulf compared to the rest of the United States. And these are numbers that I've been calculating since, uh, since the disaster happened. So this is comparing 2009, the year before the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster, to today. So Gulf-wide, catches of oysters declined by 6.6 .6 million pounds between 2009 and 2016 while Gulf shrimp catch, catches declined by 37.5 million pounds. Over the same period, the percentage of US oysters from the Gulf fell from 61% to 45% today, while Gulf shrimp declined from 81% of the US total to 72% today. The species decline shows a continuing weakness within the system, but then beyond that, we have a law in the United States, the Oil Pollution Act, one of the, that is a result of the Exxon Valdez disaster. It requires a lot of things of companies. BP was required to do a lot of things as a result of the disaster. One was to be the responsible party. The other one was essentially to put everything back where it was. Um, what that meant in some cases was financial uh, reimbursements to people who suffered losses. Um, immediately after the disaster struck, um, 
people knew that there was, um, so one of the first things that happened was that in order to drill in the U.S. Gulf Coast, BP, like every other company, had to certify that it had an oil response plan in place. It guaranteed in that oil response plan that it could handle an oil spill and a deep water blowout twice the size of the Deepwater Horizon disaster. It said that it knew how to control the blowout. It said that it had the equipment ready to handle the spill. It knew what to do and it was prepared. What we learned once it happened was that in fact no company knew how to address a blowout in the deep water. Instead what they did was apply shallow water technology on the fly to try to stop a deep water blowout. It predictably failed. But what we were constantly being told on the television was, we know how to handle this, it'll be over. People thought it'll, it'll be over in a couple days because that's what we were being told by Tony Hayward, who's of course no longer the head of BP. Um, it'll be over in a couple weeks, it'll be over in a, in, in a month, it'll be over in two months. Three months the oil was spilling, the impacts continued for significantly longer. But that meant that people were expecting perhaps a short disaster. So when people came knocking saying, you can get a $5,000 payout now if you sign a piece of paper that says you'll never sue us and you won't ask for any more money, small fishers all across the Gulf took that, small businesses all across the Gulf took that. And the result was, in addition to those decline in catches, smaller um, fisher folk put out of business all across the coast, um, smaller businesses put out of business all across the coast and continued decline um, in catches. But though that's just one part of the, um, the toll. So where I was gonna move next is one of the requirements in the Oil Pollution Act is also a national, a national damage assessment. What was the environmental impact? So that was completed recently. The findings include, and just let me read this for a moment. Um, Eight point three billion oysters in the Gulf were lost as a result of the oil spill. The national, uh, sorry, um, the oil spill killed as many as five trillion larval fish. Up to twenty percent of the Kemp, Kemp's Ridley adult female turtles in the Gulf were also killed. Ninety-three species of birds were exposed to BP oil with brown and white pelicans, laughing gulls, black skimmers, white. Am I saying it right? Ibis, double-crested. I don't know the names of the birds. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. Um, common loons and several species of terns were particularly hard hit. Nearly, nearly all of the population of dolphins and whales in the affected areas have, quote, demonstrable quantifiable injuries. In the five years after the disaster, which is when the report came out, more than three quarters of pregnant bottlenose dolphins in the oiled areas failed to give birth to a viable calf. Their populations could ultimately decline by more than half before they recover, which could take as long as 50 years. The most affected species of marine mammal living in the deeper waters were birds, whales, brides, whales, apologize. Nearly half were exposed to oil and nearly a quarter died, jeopardizing the possible survival of the species in the Gulf. The list goes on. Where BP was drilling in the Gulf of Mexico is half the depth of the proposal here. This is an ultra deep water well that's being proposed here. That was just a deep water well. This is twice as deep. It's also though only 48 kilometers away from Sable Island. That's 30 kilometers closer than the closest shoreline to where the BP disaster struck. So you have a marine, uh, you have a very sensitive area significantly closer. It's also, um, just get back this. Um, the drilling is taking place in an offshore ecologically and biologically significant area near critical fisheries, whale habitats, and marine protected areas. There were many lessons learned from the BP disaster. I mean one was just very basic and the shell example I said I think highlights some of this problem. The judge, Judge Carl Barbier, who was the federal judge who ruled on all of the cases involving the BP disaster, a Louisianan, 
He had been invested in oil beforehand. He was no enemy of the oil industry. He gave a very harsh ruling against BP. And the nut of his ruling was, in which he found, um, well, the nut of his ruling was, BP was making decisions based on saving time and saving money. It was being driven by profit. And that is what caused the disaster. And I can spend an hour walking through, and hopefully I can do it in questions, all the many, many pieces that led to this disaster happening, including the one that to me personally is, is the most shocking. The primary piece of equipment that stops a blowout is a blowout preventer. It sits at the bottom of the ocean on top of the well. If you think about deep water drilling, the way I imagine how difficult it is, is imagine um, you've put a bag of popcorn in the microwave and you've got it all blown up and you pull it out. Then you stick a straw in it and put your thumb on the straw. The popcorn is the oil. The air is the gas. The straw is the pipe. Your thumb is a cement job that's supposed to be holding it in place. Add to that an enormous amount of uh, a supply of water on top of your head that's pushing down on your ability to deal with all of this. And that gives you a sense of the pressure involved. The blowout preventer is what caps, sorry, excuse me, this is your rig. The blowout preventer is down here on the, at the base of the well. So you've got this gas that's trying to push out, you've got the pressure coming down, it all wants to come out. The blowout preventer is the idea that if the gas in particular tries to come out first, but if, it, if it, the well blows, if you lose control of the well, it will literally lock in the pipe. It has shears that cut in the pipe, lock it in, prevents a blowout. Well, it turns out blowout preventers only work about 50% of the time, even though they're the last line of defense. But even within that 50% of the time, you expect it to work. Well, BP have let their blowout preventer run out of batteries. Didn't work, didn't deploy. The level of technological complexity that goes into drilling a deep water well is profound. Everyone I've ever interviewed in the industry, who regulate this industry, who is from the industry, says there is no way of doing this risk free and the deeper we go, the more difficult it is and the more dangerous it is. But you would think that some of these basic things like keeping your batteries charged would be on the list. And then that's when I come back to the interviews with the workers. Um, the proposal that's been put forward for Nova Scotia, I asked um, Dr. Robert B, who's a 35-year um, Shell Oil, uh, excuse me, oil industry veteran, including for Shell Oil, he worked here. He uh, became a safety expert, moved into risk assessments. He was on um, the Deepwater Horizon study group, which provided key evidence to the um, National Oil Spill Commission in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the United States. He recently testified in Australia against BP's plans to drill in the Australian Bight uh, because of concerns about the lack of lessons learned since Deepwater Horizon. I asked him to look at the publicly available information on BP's plans to drill here. He said he shares those same concerns here, that the picture that BP has painted in its documents and what's publicly available, so that's the environmental assessment of the Canadian government of BP's plans are the rosiest possible picture for everything. And he worries greatly that if you're looking at a risk assessment, which is what he does, that the risk assessment remains within the high risk zone and not the low risk zone. Um, and that was the caution that he um, sent me with from reading those reports. Um, I have more that I was hoping to say, but I've gone on even longer than I was supposed to. So thank you for your time and your graciousness in having me here, and I look forward to your questions.
Thank you so much, Antonia. We spent the uh, day with Antonia, and she has much, much more to tell us. I wish you could all have been there. Uh, one of the most encouraging things for me was um, her accounts of the resistance that's coming out of the U.S., especially the eastern seaboard, uh, to the U.S. government's proposal to open up offshore drilling. So ask a question about that, because um, it will give you hope, I promise. Um, um, and there's lots more, so buy the book. Um, so I also want to just acknowledge the other members of the uh, Campaign to Protect Offshore Nova Scotia who are here tonight, uh, Jane and um, Marilyn and Peter, and we have some Council of Canadians people here as well. And I also need to acknowledge our mentor and friend, John Davis, who is the uh, founder and the director of the Clean Ocean Action Committee. We would not be doing this work if it weren't for the work that they've been doing. Um, so. It may be puzzling um, to us that the federal government went ahead and approved this BP project um, because you will remember possibly in the, uh, during the 2015 election campaign, this quote um, from the leader, we will make environmental assessment credible again. Um, the liberal approval of this project uh, is justified by them uh, on the unlikelihood of a major blowout and their confidence, falsely we would claim, in BP's preventive and mitigation um, measures. So that is, um, and if you were paying attention to what Antonia said, you, you um, can see the danger in that belief. Um, so why, why did they approve it? Well, we would argue that our government is being too heavily influenced by big oil lobby. That should come as no surprise. Um, Right after they approved the BP project, they introduced um, Bill C-69, which is going to overhaul environmental assessments. What it does is it threatens to actually weaken regulation because it wants to give more power, not less, more power, to the environmental uh, assessment in the process to the Canada Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board and also the Canada Newfoundland Offshore Petroleum Board. Um, and these uh, boards are, are made up of unelected um, political appointees, and they are primarily veterans of the oil industry. So those are not only now the regulators that our um, processes are in the hands of, but if this bill passes, they will be given um, authority far beyond their current mandate. Um, so you heard from Antonia that one of the prime problems in in the Gulf was the failure of the regulatory process. So we are deeply concerned um, that our federal government uh, is completely captured by the oil industry. And so we need to take action to make sure that these boards do not get any more power. Um, so I'd like now to introduce our second speaker, Michelle Paul. Michelle is a Mi'kmaq activist. She's a treaty rights holder. She's been involved with the Idle No More movement, the Treaty Truck House, the Alton Gas Resistance, and she's fearless. Um, Michelle's going to speak tonight uh, to the importance of land and water to Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. And she'll also connect the dots, I think, for us um, to show how the consultation process with both non-Indigenous and um, Indigenous communities has failed us. So welcome, Michelle. I was just informed that my PowerPoint is in here. I had some awesome pictures for you. Just imagine them in your head. <laughs> it was pictures of all the awesome protests that we've had. So um, how do I follow that? I didn't write a book yet. Um, and I'm not a president or vice president of any association um, yet. No. But I do have a very important role. 13 years ago, I gave birth to a daughter. So, for all the mothers in the room, I think you know what that means. 
on that day, I knew, you know, besides that my life was not going to be the same. <laughs> no, seriously. You know, that's an important role. Like, as a Mi'kmaq woman, I'm given teachings, you know, about what it means to be a mother. I, um, I'm a life giver. Um, I'll just be brief about this, Angela. <laughs> As a life giver, you know, when you're growing a baby in your belly, your baby grows inside, you know, there's water in your belly. And you know when we're protesting, you see all those signs, water is life. Well, it is. Your baby grows in your belly and there's water there. So, water is life. That's, that's where life comes from. And how can these companies have the audacity to stroll up in here on our homelands and think that we're going to allow them to destroy our lives? That's our water. That's our life. So some of you may know that some of us have been protecting our life, our river. The Shubenacadie River. Because one of these companies called Alton Gas, they, they strolled up here years ago. You would have seen the pictures. They came and they the government gave them permits, which are just pieces of papers. It has nothing to do with our law, because we have something called treaty law, which surpasses any of their laws that they came over here and created. In any case, they came over here and they decided to do this project called Alton Gas, where they wanted to dig deep holes into our land and store some gas and then take out the salt and dump it in our river. No. We've been there ever since protecting our river. Successfully. With our treaty rights. And actually, there's a water protector in the room right there. The beautiful blue-haired lady. <laughs> and I want to remind you too, um, it's just not the Mi'kmaq who are uh, protecting and using our rights. It's, it's everybody. And I'll get into that later. I just wanted to give Trish a shout out. <laughs> so that's just my intro as a, as a mother. No, I'm not an author yet. No, I don't have a title above my head. But as a mother, that's the most important role that I can have on this earth. And I take it very seriously. So when anybody comes in and tries to threaten my life and my, the future of my child and everybody else's children for that matter. And the unborn, because I see a lady over here with an unborn child in her belly. I stand up for you with the stripes on. I seen you when you came in here. So, I don't call myself an activist. I'm, I'm just a mother. That's, I'm just a mother who cares about my daughter and, and everybody else's children. So I've been involved in some actions for many years now because these companies, they think they can come in here on my homeland and mess with us. <laughs> like, I have, before I go on, I just have to ask, because I'm nosy. <laughs> Is there anybody in here who represents BP? I'm just going to call you out. If there is, can you identify yourself now? We'll find out. So, I don't represent BP, but I'm supportive of the activity, if that's what you're Well, you're, you're a brave man for, um, I'm going to applaud you right now. <laughs> give him a round of applause. Because you're brave for sitting there, and I am going to call you out. Happy to enjoy the conversation. Okay. Because you, you've heard from Antonia here. And she, she gave us all, um, you know, an education on the dangers of what can happen if, I say if, not when, because it ain't happening, but if offshore drilling were to come to Nova Scotia, because it already, the proof is it already happened down there. And I remember, like, what is it, eight years ago when that 
oil was spewing up. And I, I remember that footage on TV constantly for three months straight. I remember that's here. I remember that. It, it, you remember it. I remember it. It's in, in, imprinted in my brain. It was horrible. I also remember in my recent memory, fish coming up with shore, a whale, a turtle even, in Eskosomi. This happened just recently. So February 1st, was it, that they announced this press release saying that they've given the BP permits? Okay, says who? Who? Who did they talk to? Did anybody, did they talk to you? Who? Did they, who did they talk to? I want to know. Because I read, I read, um, there's like pages and pages. Is it 200 or 400, Robin? 400. Robin emailed me this thing. 400 things. <laughs> pages. And I don't know, was it on page 24? Page 24. My chief. My chief. My Indian Act chief. I'm going to explain that. My Indian Act chief was consulted and I'm insulted because they deem that that's okay to go and talk to those chiefs. The Indian Act is a federal policy that was created by the federal government. Of course it was. And I told my friends today, that's got nothing to do with our treaty. Think about it, guys. The federal government made that document. We didn't make it. It's not our treaty. It does not represent our treaty. It's a false treaty, if anything. But it doesn't represent our treaty because if it did, guess what? We would have our land, right? Because our treaty protects our land and our rights and our fishing rights and all of that stuff. So those Indian Act chiefs, they work for the federal government because they're paid by the federal government. And here in Nova Scotia, we have 13 of those Indian Act chiefs 12 of which sit on something that we call KMK. That's an acronym for a Mi'kmaq word that is supposed to convey a concept that is likely to we are seeking consensus. <laughs> no, they're not because they don't talk to the people. They don't. Um, so they talk to KMK, the 12 chiefs, because one of those chiefs, because I told you there's 13, one of them is, has not been in the process. It so happens to be the, the Spag and Negative chief, the one who is um, where Alton Gas is, <laughs> not Ford. Actually, the Millbrook chief opted out of that process too. So what I'm going to say is this. If we have roughly, Billy, like 33,000 Mi'kmaq, Let's just say there's 33,000 identified Mi'kmaq here in Nova Scotia. We're just gonna say Nova Scotia because this is the borders, the, the province here that we're talking about. I, I want you guys to know though that Mi'kmaq, the territory, the homeland, consists of Nova Scotia, PEI, New Brunswick, parts of Quebec, and parts of Maine. For all intents and purposes, that's our homeland. But for Nova Scotia, 33,000, we're going to say Mi'kmaq. So let's talk about what that means when we talk about the Indian Act chiefs that they say they consulted. Right. So 33,000. KMK would need 50% to have a mandate because that's how it works in the colonial, you know, Rob, what is it? Rob, Robert's Rules of oh. that one. Which yeah, that. So. 50% would be like what? 17,000? I don't know. So let's just say 17,000 they would need Big Ma to, to get the mandate to represent us, right? Let's just say that, right? Okay. But that would be if they had all 13 chiefs. But they don't. Oh, okay. Well, the one that they don't have represents a community of about, I don't know, 3,000? Knock off 3,000. Oh! You see? They don't have the mandate. Okay, so they consulted KMK, who does not speak for the Mi'kmaq. There you have it. So that's a fake consensus or a consultation or whatever you call it. Then we talk about under United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People. Free and form prior consent. That's not been done. Consent, not consultation. Consent, 
not consultation, says the elder, right? Duty to consult. All these terms, right? These legal terms, but they they are legal, right? They've all been surpassed. They just, they do have meaning. So BP has permits, I guess. Is it permits or is it license? Whatever those words are, they don't mean a thing because we have something called treaty. Go Google it. <laughs> treaty 1752. Go back further. Google 1725. That's a great one. That one. Hey, just do the Royal Proclamation. 1763. How about that? That's the beautiful one. You know what, you guys? When I was involved in Elsie Book Book back four years ago, I wish the picture was here. <laughs> A company called SWN. They come in. They they were exploring for gas. They were doing seismic testing, dumper trucks. Um, you know, we held the front lines. They um, Son was there. Billy was there. Angela was there. It it was quite an experience. And it was a beautiful experience. It was very taxing. It was very um, hard on the spirit, but it was beautiful. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it wasn't just the Mi'kmaq. It was everybody. We had camps set up. And when we were there, we, when we had nothing, trucks, vans would pull up, and then there would be truckloads of water from different surrounding communities. And it was like, oh, like we were praying every day, sunrise ceremonies, and then all these women would show up constantly, Acadian women, with big pots of soup and everything you could think of. Then all of a sudden we had to make a kitchen because we had all this food. So every <coughs> camp had a kitchen, and we had tents, and we had everything you would need, right? It was just like a little village that we had that popped up. We had people. We had Acadians, we had English, we had Mi'kmaq all coming together. And then the government knew that they were messed. It was over for the government. I have one minute left. So my message is gonna be this. BP, I hate to burst your bubble, but it ain't gonna happen. I know you're a proponent, right? Kudos to you. But it ain't just the power of my treaty. I see all these people here tonight, and I see young people, and there's a baby in her belly. That's powerful medicine. It ain't gonna happen. Am I right? I think for us to be considering the Mi'kmaq perspective in all of this as well. Um, so in this moment in history, uh, we really have a responsibility to acknowledge the crisis of climate change. This is one of the reasons that the Council of Canadians is involved in this, this issue. And in recent months, we've seen countries like France, Costa Rica, Belize take important steps towards <coughs> acknowledging um, the need to stop increasing fossil fuel exploration and expansion. And they've instead been focusing on the shift towards renewable energy use and efficiency, um, sustainable transportation, uh, green job generating actions to reduce climate pollution. Here in what we know as Canada, uh, we've historically been a resource country. And while this won't change overnight, we have to determine when enough is enough on this front. Evidence documented by Oil Change International finds that new fossil fuel projects are inconsistent with Canada's commitments under the Paris Climate Agreement. 
Um, allowing BP and other com uh, companies to explore for oil and gas in this context of what, um, at a time when we're needing to be addressing the climate issue is irresponsible at best. So while protecting our climate is clearly one of our concerns, the local impacts on communities and e the economy is also critical. And I know this will come up in the Q&A and I'm sure part of why people might support this project is this whole idea of jobs and benefit to the economy, et cetera. So I really hope we'll get to that in the Q&A. Um, so while all of these countries are recognizing the need to stop oil and gas exploration, and expansion, New England states, as have, has already been mentioned, are also trying to block offshore development for fear of threatening the fishery. Um, so we have to ask why we're willing to risk our fishery as well as tourism and other industries that depend on the ocean and the coast um, when and risk millions of people's jobs and livelihoods when um, when clearly the, the New England states and as our neighbors are opposed to it. So with this in mind, I'd like to uh, introduce our last speaker, Colin Sproul. Colin is a fisherman, father, and successful entrepreneur with deep roots in, in Annapolis County. He has a proven track record at the Bay of Fundy Inshore Fishermen's Association, where he serves as a board director, vice president, and spokesperson. Welcome, Colin. Apologies, folks. Endless technical challenges today. Oh, come on. Oh, that's nice. Maybe just while we're getting the PowerPoint set up, <laughs> yes. we can take a minute to thank our co-sponsors. So CPONS, the Campaign to Protect Offshore Nova Scotia, the Clean Action Ocean Committee, Sierra Club Canada Foundation, the Ecology Action Center, and Divest DAL. Um, thanks to the Canada Research Chair in Sustainability and Social Change for lending this live streaming gear for us to be able to live stream the event as well tonight. And thanks, Robin, for dealing with all our tech issues. Sorry, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> thanks, Robin. Thanks, Robin. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. And I just want to thank the Council Canadians for inviting me. I'm really, uh, really happy to be here and raise awareness. My name's Colin Sproul. I'm a fifth generation fisherman from the small port of Glapse Cove on the Bay of Fundy Coast. And my family's history in the area and connection to the sea go back hundreds of years. This picture from my great-grandfather's collection shows a turn schooner alongside the wharf at the Labs Cove in the 1860s. And here's a present-day picture of my family's boat at the wharf. In many ways, things are much the same today as they were then. The same families earning a living from the sea in a sustainable and socially responsible fashion. Here are some shots of my brother and I at work on the boat. This is truly a family tradition for us. Besides being a fisherman, I've also been a member of the Bay of Fundy Inshore Fishermen's Association for over 20 years where I serve as vice president and spokesperson. We represent approximately 175 small-scale owner-operator fishing businesses. The BFIFA has a distinguished history of advocating for sustainable fishing practices and community-based management. The association has been a leader in peaceful coexistence between non-native and First Nations fishers through our membership in the Marine Resource Council. And over the years, our commitment to sustainability has led us to partnerships with groups like the World Wildlife Fund, Ecology Action Center, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and many others on issues as wide ranging as stock assessments and sustainable sourcing of hook and line caught fish. We have a long history of cooperation with governments and regulators at all levels, and this has given us a reputation as a valuable ally on ocean issues. 
Our pioneering of community-based fisheries management has been commended by people like David Suzuki, and it serves as an example for the success of community fishing quota allocations, which stands in stark contrast to the corporate ITQ system. The association and our work receives national attention. Needless to say, our members are proud of their legacy as progressive fishers who embrace a different way of doing things, and we are all committed 100% to preserving this way of life for future generations of Nova Scotians. Yeah, sure. Too tall for your mic. <clears throat> so what I came to talk about today was not to argue against an industry, but to argue for an industry. The economic impact of the fishing industry in Nova Scotia cannot be underestimated. In 2016, you'll see here that our export value was $1.8 billion. The lobster fishery alone generated a landed value of $600 million last year, and conservative economic estimates are a four to one economic activity multiplier. That, that translates into $3 billion of economic activity in this province from the lobster fishery alone. That's something that certainly needs protection. We create more than 25,000 direct jobs in the industry, not, not to count the endless amounts of spin-off employment in Nova Scotia. And most importantly of all, an industry like the fishing industry creates a diffuse economic benefit across this province in remote and rural areas where large-scale industries will, can never extend their reach. But more important of all is that the lobster fishery is an integral part of our culture, of our culture and our identity. People in Nova Scotia have a unique connection to the sea and a unique connection to the fishery. Our presence in these waters is also directly tied to the all-important tourism industry, which may even eclipse us in value at, at around $3 billion a year in sales. Um, it's really hard to quantify how important the, these fisheries are for Western Nova Scotia. We're a bright spot in the economy of rural Nova Scotia. We're just booming in our economies, Digby, Yarmouth, Shelburne. All of these areas are, are just, you know, like vastly ahead of other coastal areas in Nova Scotia, and it's entirely dependent on the fishery. Last year, the highest truck sales in Canada were at the Yarmouth car dealers. So, besides the Besides the economic value of, of all of that, it, it's not what leads people like me to defend our industry and to argue for it. It's about the history and the connection and the will to see our future generations like my son be able to pursue the lifestyle that we had. We're at a unique situation now in the lobster fishery where really good management has led to incredible catches. We, we have record catches year over year for the last 15 years. And at the same time, it is a limited supply, but more and more consumers are entering our marketplace, especially with the opening of Asian marketplaces for, for lobster. And what this equals is long-term growth in market value of seafood products. This, the fishing industry had the highest growth over the last three years, year over year, of any industry in Canada. We're looking at 10% growth per year which is much higher than the energy industry at two or three. And more so, we're doing things right, and that's evidenced in our catches. We have effective conservation measures, which have resulted in these record landings, but we're also trying to do better than that. We have an important industry-led initiative underway to monitor and limit bycatch from the lobster fishery, and we cooperate with the federal government and with uh, national and international conservationists to aid in North Atlantic right whale recovery. And we try to improve our environmental and human safety standards each year, and we've had a lot of success. So I think that I just, what I really want to do now is explain to you a little bit about the value of the Scotian Shelf. The area here that's uh, marked with the yellow squares is where, is where BP's lease site approvals are, and you'll see it's directly in the path of the Labrador current. These currents uh, would carry any potential oil spill in that area into the massive tidal flow of the Bay of Fundy, which you can see in the diagram. The, uh, the potential for George's Bank and our, all of our offshore banks in the Goshen Slope as a fishery spawning ground is unmatched anywhere else on earth. 
this is really the foundation of Canada and, and why Europeans came here. This is what they wanted. And you can see that evidenced in these graphs of groundfish landings on the Scotian Shelf. The darker colors here represent the highest levels of groundfish landings. In these same areas adjacent to the drill sites, you have the most important scallop nursery beds on Earth, important head spawning sites which are close to commercial fishing because of their critical nature. And most important of all in Nova Scotia's economy, this is the engine of larval, of larval lobster production for Atlantic Canada. The box that's delineated lobster fishing area 40 is completely closed to all commercial lobster fishing. And the reason for that is because of the extreme concentration of egg bearing female lobsters on the site. These two diagrams on the right show larval distribution of those lobsters. And you can see how those same tides carry those larval lobsters into the Bay of Fundy and onto the other offshore banks. That right there is the economic underpinning of Nova Scotia. We're at a unique place in Nova Scotia where we have one of the highest percentages of public sector workers in North America. At some point, people besides lobster fishermen need to connect the zeros on your paycheck to this graph that you see here because we are the economic underpinnings of this province. We are the engine that drives it. These resource extraction economies in Nova Scotia are what matters. One of the things that's most concerning to fishermen is the duplicity in ocean protection that's exhibited by our federal and provincial governments. We are constantly asked to go further. We are monitored and policed at every level to ensure that we limit our impacts to the environment and that we operate our industry in a sustainable fashion. And I think that there's one example of this duplicity that's, that's more stark than any of the others, and it's the Roseway Basin that you see marked here. This has been identified by DFO and by all conservation groups as critical habitat for the survival of the North Atlantic right whale. It's their prime summer feeding ground in the Gulf. Of, uh, sorry, near the Gulf of Maine. And uh, it's about 200 kilometers from, from the site. My members fish this area in the summertime for ground fish, and it's a really important area for them as it's the only place that there are fish at that time of year. It's really important for their income. And we're very close to seeing it declared a marine protected area and exclude all fishing activity which the members will accept because they understand that the survival of the great whales is, is integral to their survival too. Every part of our ecosystem is important. But what we can accept is that they could be placed in an even graver danger by another industry which wants to emerge in our waters. That's just wrong. We need to play by the same set of rules and we feel that that's a fair ask. We're not trying to be obstructionists. but. When we get to these points, it makes it harder for a person like me to sell progressive environmental policy to our membership. They will always come back to me with the argument, why should we change? Why should we take a loss when a multi-billion dollar multinational oil company can come in and place the whales that we have to move to protect into even greater danger? I think it bears pointing out that this is not the Gulf of Mexico. This is the North Atlantic Ocean. A potential spill area here is within the massive tidal flow of the Bay of Fundy, which means the fastest spreading disaster on Earth because of the speed and the power of our tides. The average wave heights here are never less than one meter, and the average current is never less than one knot. And the winter conditions are extremely harsh, much more dynamic than the Gulf of Mexico, where after listening to Antonia, we realized that, that the cleanup measures were really ineffective with less than 10% of oil removed from the Gulf. The skimming, booms, dispersant spraying, all of those things would be less effective here in the North Atlantic Ocean. And we're much further from emergency response in Halifax. Uh, this is just a, another diagram to, to help you understand the tidal flow from the Labrador Current and the Bay of Fundy and the Georges Bank Gyre. And you can see the Georges Bank Gyre, the circular current there, would, would trap any spreading oil over top of Georges Bank, which is, un, you know, inarguably the most important spawning ground for fish on Earth. How do you talk about this problem without sounding alarmist? It's, it's, a really, it's a really tough question. I don't want to be an alarmist, but 
we're in a situation here with ultra deep water drilling where one human error can lead to a catastrophic event which can end my way of life and my family's way of life and seriously damage the economy of Nova Scotia. We can see critical spawning grounds destroyed. Oil reaching the Bay of Fundy and its critical estuaries and the beauty of the South Shore, which would generate economic ruin in Western Nova Scotia. More important for the fishing industry is that even if the seafood harvested from Nova Scotia after such an event was safe to eat, people would still not eat it. Markets move on and there would be no demand for our seafood. Would any of you eat fish from Prince William Sound if you saw it advertised as such? And wait a minute, why do you even know where Prince William Sound is? It's because forever after you will associate it with an oil spill. That's something that no mitigation efforts, cleanup efforts can never deal with. And that stain would remain on the Nova Scotia seafood brand forever. And that is something that market share is something that we fought long and hard for. And we're in a great position now with huge catches and an export advantage over our American competitors of up to 20% in the Asian and European markets. This is the time for the seafood sector to keep expanding and capitalize on all of our work so far. I'd also like to point out that there would be no fair compensation for devastated communities. As Antonia mentioned, the effects are so far reaching and long lasting that it's really hard to calculate what they would be. And I'd also like to point out that Fishers and Prince William Sound relate that they feel they've been compensated for about 10 cents on the dollar for their losses, and some of them waited up to 20 years for that compensation. A quarter of the plaintiffs died in the process of waiting. Exxon Valdez to be solved, to be resolved. What Antonia said was that a quarter of the plaintiffs in the Exxon Valdez case died while they waited for the case to be resolved. And I'd also point out that the average age of an owner operator fisherman in Nova Scotia is 57 years old. So why not here? Norway has a strong oil and gas industry that coexists with a well managed fishery. They've successfully protected their fishery spawning grounds while delivering enormous wealth for social programs back into their country. Most important of all, they have appropriate safety equipment on site. If a deep water blowout were to occur in the Scotian Basin project where BP plans to drill this spring, the nearest capping stack to be deployed would be in Norway. Why is it in Norway? Because responsible governments in Norway require a capping stack on site when drilling adjacent to a fishery spawning ground. Ironically enough, Statoil, a Norwegian state-owned company, has also applied to drill here on the Scotian shelf and they won't be required to bring their capping stack with them. Fishers of Nova Scotia feel that it's reasonable to expect these same measures to protect our way of life here. And I don't think that's an obstructionist view, I don't think it's a NIMBY view at all, I think that it's an economically sound viewpoint. And I think that it's, it's a, an easy position for us to hold as fishers. One more thing that I'd like to point out when I talk about the duplicity of, ocean, man, of uh, ocean protections is that this site lies 45 nautical miles away from the Gully Marine Protected Area, which was just protected for deep water corals in the recent past, and it was a, a triumph for conservationists in Nova Scotia and for the Ecology Action Center. And the deep water corals there are some of the rarest on earth and they really deserve to be protected and it's a great example of, of that duplicity. Um, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Your attendance here makes you an exception in Nova Scotia. You've chosen to focus your attention on an issue that is largely out of sight and out of mind. But this is at the crux of all ocean protection issues in our waters and it's also what offshore developers are banking on. Please share what you've learned here tonight with your friends, neighbors, and colleagues. We can protect this coast, but we can't do it without the Mi'kmaq Nation, and we can't do it without people like you. And I'd really like to take a moment to thank John Davis. I'm really standing on his shoulders tonight. A lot of what I talked about is John's research, and uh, there's no greater friend of fishermen in Nova Scotia. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
More? Okay, thank you. Um, Angela mentioned our co-sponsors, but I just want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge the offshore alliance that grew out of this work that many of us were doing and concerned about um, the regulatory process. So uh, several organizations, including the Ecology Action Center and the Sierra Club, are working with the Council of Canadians and with CPONS and with the Clean Ocean Action Committee. And if you look at our at the CPONS um, display table at the back, you will see the list. There are 20 organizations, and many of them are fishing organizations. So it's actually become a really important um, and significant uh, group. And we plan to continue to work together, and we would welcome involvement from anybody in this room who would like to join us. Um, so now um, comes time for our questions. Um, we're going to get to those soon, but um, we're just about to hand around a uh, Council of Canadians petition. Um, this is an opportunity for you to send a message to Prime Minister Trudeau to stop BP's approval. Um, it's not too late to do that. And to put an end to the proposed changes under Bill C-69 that's going to, as we talked about earlier, um, grant more um, authority and more decision-making power in environmental assessment to the Canada Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board and the Canada Newfoundland Offshore Petroleum Board. We didn't have time to talk about the Canada Newfoundland Offshore Petroleum Board tonight, but um, it's the same. It's the same pattern. Um, so we also want to encourage you to consider joining the Council of Canadians. We have membership uh, forums. We, as a group, or, um, rely completely on the support of people like you and communities across this country that do this kind of work on uh, energy and climate and water, trade, health care, um, and also to take a look at the information that we have at the back and again to recognize our co-sponsors who are also worthy of your support. So now to the questions. Um, I, I want to take three questions and give the panelists um, an opportunity to respond or whichever one of the panelists feels um, that they would like to respond to that question. And we're going to really insist on a one minute question and a question, not a statement, um, because we want to allow more people to, to participate and we also want to um, have a chance to hear uh, from the speakers <laughs> to address it. So we're really going to um, keep to the schedule. I may call on Angela to help me if, uh, <laughs> if people uh, aren't able to. Can I say something before they come? You may say something. <laughs> I just want to say something before you um, don't leave. Don't leave. <laughs> Can you fill that out, sir, before you leave? I want to say something. OK, I'm going to say it. The Council of Canadians has supported the Mi'kmaq Nation on every single initiative and effort that we've had in the last several years. Without the Council of Canadians, we would not have been successful in, in getting these beasts and monsters companies away from our territory. You have to know that the Council of Canadians, along with other um, allies and, and um, organizations, they've been there from day one at Elsie Bookdook. They've been there all the while at Alton Gas. They've been there for at Petroworth in, in um, Unamagi, they were there um, at Blue Cat Mountain. You need to know that. That's not a plug, it's the truth. They're not paying me to say that, that's the truth. Like, they, they've been there, they're sincere people and they mean, uh, their hearts are there to stop these people, their hearts are there for the water, for the environment. They didn't know I was gonna do that. But I, I feel I had to say it, I see the students here, I, I know there's a lot of elders here, but for you students, if you wanna get involved in something, in like activism and political activism and social justice initiatives, these are the people to um, connect with. I didn't know that's what you're going to say when I said. Um, okay, so yeah, so um, three questions, uh, one minute each, and who, if um, yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Lisa Roberts. I'm the NDP um, in Nova Scotia's uh, energy spokesperson and also um, fishery spokesperson. And really nice to see you and to learn from all the speakers. I was wondering if Antonia, um, in particular, could address whether you know, based on your research, or whether you would have given an opinion based on your research, if it is possible 
to safely do a deep water drilling project on the Scotian shelf. I mean, Colin spoke about the distance to a capping stack. Um, you know, if it were possible to bring a capping stack, I mean, in fact, it is possible to bring a capping stack. If we required that a capping stack were here, in all the best case scenarios, what, what, what can you share with us based on your research in terms of how much that inevitable risk can be reduced? Thank you. Another question? Um, Ray, I believe? Yeah. Uh, my name is Ray Ritzy. I'm uh, the CEO of the Maritimes Energy Association, which is an industry association that supports, uh, energy, it represents the supply chain that supports the energy sector not just non-renewable, but renewable and clean tech, offshore and onshore. So, and we've been around for a long time, and we've been supportive of, obviously, uh, this initiative, as I said earlier, to Michelle's question, and uh, we're hopeful that uh, BP has success off the coast, because we believe the benefits are significant uh, to Nova Scotia. My question for Antonia is, and thank you very much, uh, for coming here and, and the presentation. It's related to, and I'm really picking up on your op-ed that uh, appeared in the Chronicle Herald. Would you mind sharing with the audience the history, just briefly, of drilling on the uh, eastern seaboard in the Atlantic Ocean? Compare that with the activity of Atlantic Canada in terms of when it began, the number of wells that have been drilled and the number of incidents that have occurred in the Atlantic Ocean. And again, I'm picking up on, on the op-ed that uh, was in the Chronicle Herald. Could you share the data points, those three data points, when it began, how many wells have been drilled, and whether there's been any incidents? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, we had another question in the back, I think. One more now. I know there was a hand up here. Oh, way over in the corner. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's my understanding um, from the Gulf of Mexico that uh, the main, like even, even bigger problem than the oil that was spilled was the chemical dispersants used afterwards. Mm -hmm. Is there any effort here like to prevent um, dispersants such as Brexit and other chemicals that may be even worse than the oil itself from being used here? Okay, thanks. So I think the first two questions were both for Antonia and maybe Colin will answer the third one. Um, maybe I'll say it because I'm better. It's easier to say. I'll stay here. Um, I'm short, so I like to stand when I talk. <laughs> um, okay, so the first question on is it possible to do it safely? So word choice is really important here. I believe with all oil activity, it's possible to do it safer. It's possible to do it better. It's possible to do it more wisely. But is it possible for it to necessarily be safe? Is it possible for it to necessarily be clean? Is it possible for it necessarily to be healthy? I would never guarantee that, nor would an oil company. <laughs> um, and I'll just read for you the quote that I put in my op-ed in the Chronicle um, from William K. Riley, who is the head of the Environmental Protection Agency under George H.W. Bush, so a Republican. He was then the co-chair of the President's National Oil Spill Commission for President Obama in the wake of the BP oil spill. He warns that even good regulation and oversight cannot prevent another disaster from happening. Quote, drilling in very deep water is a highly challenging affair that involves highly complex technologies, and they sometimes fail. One should not suffer the delusion that it can be done risk-free. That's it. Um, so this issue with the capping stack, and thank you for bringing that back up. So one of the key lessons learned from the Deepwater Horizon disaster was that the only way to temporarily, temporarily shut in a blowout is a capping stack. It took three months for BP to put in place the capping stack. Three months, even though we were told 
We know how to deal with a deep water blowout. We will deal, deal with a deep water blowout. We have the capacity to deal with a deep water blowout. Three months before a capping stack was put on that well. A capping stack is a temporary fix only. It's, a, it's like a, the temporary cork you put on, if you pop a bottle of champagne and you've already popped it, and then you want to start, sort of try and hold the bubbles a little bit, that's kind of a capping stack. The only known way for shutting in a blown out deep water well is to drill another well. So let me just make sure you understand what we're talking about. The source of the problem was drilling a well. The solution to the problem is drilling a well. So you drill a relief well. It took 152 days to drill the relief well in the Gulf of Mexico. During that entire time, the possibility of another rupture was there. You drill another hole, you intersect it with the original hole, and then you block up the original hole. That's it, it's the only known mechanism. But a really good temporary solution is the capping stack, which is why it's required in other places. They're gonna send it from Norway. That's the best lesson learned. Um, so that's the relief well. Um, sorry, there was a second part of that that I wanna make sure I said, and, and I forgot because I got excited about relief wells. Um, okay, the other issue is on this issue of safety. So that I just wanted to bring back to the issue that I was asked to address. So in the United States, we have moratoriums. We had moratoriums on offshore drilling. Um, they were put in place actually under the first George Bush, the presidential moratoriums. They were eased under the second president, George Bush. President Trump in January announced that he wants to open up all federal waters to offshore drilling. Pacific, Arctic, Florida. Okay, Florida is very important in presidential politics, so as soon as he said he wanted to open up Florida's coast to offshore drilling, he immediately took it back. <laughs> Florida is too, too important to protect. Florida won't be open to offshore drilling. And the Atlantic coast. In response to this, Republicans, Democrats on the coast were furious, and the attorneys general from 13 coastal states, including almost every single of um, Nova Scotia's closest East Coast, U.S. East Coast neighbors, wrote a letter demanding an end to the proposal, withdrawal of the proposal, saying that it was far too risky for their fisheries, their tourism, and their environment. And in particular, Maine cited its lobster industry and that it was far too much of a threat to have this drilling. And they cited the Deepwater Horizon disaster, but they also said any risk is too much risk. And it was the attorneys general, by the way, that sent the letter because they wanted the administration to know that if it moves forward with the proposal, they're going to sue. That's why it was the Attorney General who sent the letter. And I encourage you to read this letter, which I linked to, because they lay out excellent arguments as to why they think it's too risky to drill on the Atlantic coast. So the Atlantic coast. I've got the numbers in my computer that you're asking for, but I don't want to take the time to bring them out. I think the point to make is, in the 80s, there was drilling in the US Atlantic coast. Uh, the drilling began, it didn't get very far. There wasn't a lot of drilling, it wasn't very conclusive, and it was um, resistance led to it quickly being ended in addition to the fact that the market didn't support the expense of drilling. So they started, it was the mid 80s, the price collapsed, they decided not to keep drilling, but there was also great opposition to drilling evidenced by not too far after that drilling taking place is when the moratoriums got put in place on the Atlantic and the Pacific. But I think the importance of the fact that it did take place on the Atlantic coast and that the leaders of the Atlantic coast don't want it is an important point about the fact that they've had experience with it and they don't want it. Um, but I don't know enough just off the top of my head to answer all of your questions. They're very good questions, and I'll make sure I, 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 get, I get them and I can share them with, with folks. Um, the fact, there's something else I wanted to say about the Atlantic drilling. Sorry. 
Um, I don't remember. Sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry. It's Dis like on the tip of my tongue, but I can't think of it. So, Colin, you want to talk about dispersants, I think. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll address a couple of the questions, actually. First, I'll just meant to say a couple of things about Corexit. Um, I think we can all accept that skimming and booming of, of uh, oil in, in the North Atlantic Ocean would be really ineffective. And the only other thing that proponents have proposed is deep water injection and aerial spraying of dispersants near our fishery spawning grounds. Uh, I think first and foremost, you need to understand that the dispersants cause a big percentage of the oil to sink, as Antonia detailed. There'd be nothing any more lethal to the deep water corals that the Gully Marine Protected Area has been designed to protect. They're some of the rarest life forms on Earth. And sinking oil that's already on the, sur on the surface to the bottom, just so it's at a public view, has no ecological value, and it just would, would be disastrous for them. There's another really important point, too, that's been pointed out to me by North Atlantic right whale researchers, and it's that aerial spraying on the oil would disperse the oil down in to the water column, and at the same time, it would have serious effects on the copepod food chain that North Atlantic right whales need to survive. So I think those are two important things to understand about Corexit. It's really just an otocyte, otomine solution with no ecological value at all. And then I just wanted to address your question about drilling on the East Coast, and what I would say is that drilling in water this deep, in ocean conditions this rough, and in an area this close, to an important fishery spawning ground doesn't really have a precedent on the East Coast of North America. And I didn't want to talk about this, but since you brought it up, I just wanted to follow up on, on the second part of your question. And it's that you act as the leader for the Maritimes Energy Association. So it takes me into the industry capture question and the problem with conflicts on the CNSOPB. Your predecessor at your association currently sits on the Canada Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board. She is literally a proponent for the oil industry. Now, I, I'm left with the question, how can somebody in that position function as an unbiased regulator? I'm not talking about... institutions in this country need to be above the appearance of conflict. And when you are literally a proponent of the industry, it's really hard for you to do that. I'm not making a personal judgment about anybody. I would never do that. But when you accept the public role, you need to be above the appearance of these things, too. Can I say one thing on the... Um, one thing on the Corexit. So the, the, the dispersant that was used, there were two different types of Corexit that were used in the Deepwater Horizon disaster. One of those kinds, BP, sorry, Corexit 9500 is being proposed. It's in BP's proposal for one of the ways that they're going to address the oil spill. Um, we had to do all the studies on Corexit after it was used. Uh, many of the difficulties of doing the studies was that um, NorCal, is it NorCal? The company that produces it wouldn't release the components of Corexit. Um, so it took quite a bit of time to even find out generally what was in it, but there's been a great deal of science that's been conducted since. The science has several pieces, the most important being that the correct, the, when, so when the um, US EPA and BP and the Coast Guard decided to use the Corexit, they knew there were downsides to using dispersant, they were very clear over and over again that the decision they were making was to sacrifice the ocean for the shore. That was the, the stated decision. So we don't want the oil to hit shore. We don't want it to be on the surface. So we're going to sac knowingly sacrifice the ocean for the shore. There may be you know, some good points to that. Oil is toxic to humans. Oil is toxic to many animals. You don't want to interact with lots of it. You don't want it on the beach. You don't want it on the surface. The problem is, one, the oil reached the beach. The oil reached the surface. But in addition to the oil reaching the beach and re reaching the surface, the dispersant did what dispersant does. It dispersed it. So it spread it out over much more of the ocean. Also, what we learned is that the combination, so the Corexit has toxic components to it as well. The oil has toxic components. But the combination of the two is more toxic than either alone. And what it did was break down, it also breaks down the oil, so it breaks it down into more bite-sized particles. 
that are spread throughout the water column. So more of a newly developed toxic substance is dispersed throughout the ocean for critters to eat, to get into seafood. Um, one um, United Homa Nation Native American who I spent a lot of time with, the Homa Nation is um, based in Louisiana, and she said when she first saw it, you could, you, it's very easy to spot oil mixed with dispersant. It gets a very um, red-orange chemical look to it. And when she first saw the oil and dispersant streaming towards the shore, she said it looks like the ocean is bleeding, which is what it looked like. Um, finally, I would say the combination of the dispersant and the oil, which then got into the seafood, we were told repeatedly uh, how early on how that it was fairly early on to, that it was okay to eat gulf seafood. What we learned later on was that those studies were being done by the Food and Drug Administration, and it turned out, thankfully, two women scientists discovered this, that the basis of the study was using a standard American. The standard American was a 170-pound man who lived in the middle of America and ate a standard American diet. So I'm really happy that the 170-pound dude in the middle of America was well off, but if you're looking at, let's say, people who live in the Gulf Coast who eat Gulf seafood three times a day, what about the pregnant woman? What about the infant? What about the elderly person? What about the smaller woman? Okay, maybe I'm not that small anymore. I was small when I used to say that. Um, who eats much more seafood than the average diet. So let's say there's a spill here and you're told that a, you know, 175 pound man in Toronto will be fine eating his diet. Well, that's great. But if you live in a place where you consume an oil toxic infused <laughs> life sustaining resource, that's an entirely different issue. Um, so people across the Gulf believe that they had a science experiment conducted on them. Um, they will they will get more angry talking about dispersants than they will talking about oil. Oh. Thank you. Do we have room, time for one or two quick questions? Um, one over here, yes. Maybe we'll just... Can I have this gentleman over here just to get some... Okay, over and here. over here, was there somebody over here? Yeah, right here. Okay, There's so two questions and then we'll um, answer it and wrap up. Thank you. I'm a prop here at St. Mary's. I'm a Canada Research Chair in Atlantic Canada Communities. Um, one of the things that I'm aware of and my family has been involved with, I'm a, probably a five-generation fishing family as well from Cape Breton, but I wonder if it wouldn't be worth considering the links um, between this and the chemical munitions dumps that are off the coast of Nova Scotia and the eastern seaboard of the United States. Um, there is research done on that. There was concern with the, CN, the CNSOPB and the test drilling and the seismic testing and what that was going to do to disrupt the dump sites which are actually moving and releasing chemicals like mustard gas into the ocean. And I'm just wondering if considering that alongside of all of this would make a stronger case because I'm concerned about it. I don't know why the cancer rates here are so high. Maybe researchers could do something with that. Thank you. And over here. Uh, question for Paula and Michelle. Uh, Michelle, uh, we have the uh, treaty truck house, and uh, I've been out there a few times, and I've seen uh, proof that all the gas is very sneaky, yeah. and they'll come across, like, like they still own the place, even though we have got people out there protecting it all the time. Where is the treaty boat house going to be? When are the people going to be able to <laughs> offshore to make sure that they are not Because if you know, you fall asleep on the job at the truck house, they're going to sneak in and do whatever they want. You know, they have to come out and tell you that. So, where's the tree you going to be? You want to be going to the top and make sure that they're not doing this because it's, it's not about them having a federal permit. It is about a tree at this point that I can see. So I'd like to call myself an ally. It's up to you to do that. You sure, um, you're a brother. <laughs> where, where are we going to be when they, in the, you say spring? Like, that's wild. No, we can't let this happen. We work the risk is not worth it at all. I know a bunch of fishermen know it's fishing and make a ton of money and uh, it's just not worth it. That's like what they need to do free gas for life here, right? They're not gonna do anything. Like what hundred jobs? It's nothing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Who I'll wants to start? Then? Yeah, I'll follow up on that. You can make one remark about water. Just to, whereas, well, the depth is born into it. The ball from the first behavior. I speak on behalf of the marine life. Can't quite hear you. And the water life has. Yes. Mm -hmm. I sat in my front room. The video. Not one human brings of origin in the vicinity along what's called the water. As you see every mean beast, from elephants, to giraffes, or they would all muster it. Disaster, man made, just that you can satisfy your profit or your quality for, for your life to uh, come out of these. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could ask for a final comment of uh, each or whoever wants to address those two questions and then a final quick statement from each of you. I know Michelle had something and one of your questions was for you. So I just wanted to follow up on, on what you said about, about Treaty Truck House and about the effective unity there between people like Council of Canadians and, and the First Nation on the site. The key to this problem is unity between 
First Nations of Nova Scotia and other ocean users that we share these waters with, like fishers, tourism industry, <coughs> operators. But be warned that when we achieve that unity, governments and developers will seek to divide us with money, they'll seek to divide us with hate. We need to rise above all that to protect the future of Nova Scotia for all the First Nations and for everybody else too. I've spent a large portion of the last two years of my life attempting to build that unity between non-native and, and First Nations fishers in the Bay of Fundy and when we achieved success we were immediately divided with money and hate and greed by the federal government and by energy developers in Nova Scotia. Let's not let it happen again this time. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. I'd love to come sometime. Send me, send me an invitation. I'd love to come. I have to make him some seafood chowder, too. He's going to supply the fish. Um, okay. Thank you for saying that, because the Treaty Truck House, um, we can have truck houses like everywhere. We've already, we know that, right? So stay tuned. That's a plan. Um, fleets of boats can be everywhere in the water. We got the fishermen on our sides now. They got boats. That's a plan. It can go international. We already know that. We did the Treaty Island. Yeah, we did Treaty Island. That's a plan. Like, you know, all these things are possible, right? It's just, like, we got smart people here, right? And all of you guys, right? So I'm, I'm right excited. But I have to say something. I see Mr. Ritz, Ritz, Ritzy taking notes. When you own, when you were president of Heritage Gas, did you have the same uh, mentality? Like you, you seen your eye on the prize? Because or no, wait, wait, wait. When you were on the Wheeler panel, it was unanimous that you agreed to have moratorium on fracking. So, so how are you now going to be like uh, for this uh, big oil company? So, Michelle, just that was not the recommendation of the panel. Come That's on fast. now, Ray. <laughs> Oh, that's I know someone who's on the panel. No, no, that was not. No, 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 no. Back it up. So we're not going to argue with that. I just had to put that out there. Happy to have a conversation. That's fine. That. That's perfect. I just had to call you out on that because you're sitting here now for this big oil and gas company when we all know that we have a moratorium on fracking in this province. Right? And you were on that panel. And that panel is the recommendation that came forward from that panel. That was not the recommendation of the panel. That was. Well, how would we not? How do we have a? Um, what do we have? A moratorium? On high pressure hydraulics. Right? Is that right, everybody? We got a moratorium in Nova Scotia on fracking, right? And he was on the panel. So that's it. So anyway, I just wanted to say that, right? I just had to let everybody here know that Mr. Ray Ritzy, 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 he, um, he used to be the um, president of, of Heritage Gas, and then he was appointed CEO of, of the Maritime. Yeah, all the gas. That's right, Trish, I knew you wanted to hear that. That's why I had to say that. So, you know, you guys had to know. Yeah, you had to hear that. My council Canadian friends had to hear that. I'm sorry, not sorry. Listen, I think it's important that you have different Let's perspectives. Talk. I think, I think that all space. of you in this group... I think group, that you're yeah. welcome to speak at any other time and yeah. not at the event that we have created with our time and money. With all due respect, yeah. sir, I'm, I'm a person of integrity and honesty, so I just had to let my friends here know who was amongst us. Okay. Okay. I had already indicated. Okay, could we... Um, you sure did. And we're going to... Um, thanks. There's endangered species. They're supposed to be protected area. You're welcome. Yeah. Act. It hasn't been touched since, like, 2010. So that's how you think. That's yeah. the that's what the strike class spawn. Then I watch them. I actually have a recording of it. You know you guys want to pretend it. Okay, so we're going to give the last word to Antonia. We have to get... <laughs> I didn't know you were prepared to chat. I know you are. Okay, Antonia? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I mean, I, I actually think that the cool panelists did a wonderful job of wrapping things up, and this gentleman here, I actually don't think that we can say it much more profoundly than the words so, that were given us there. So yeah. I just want to thank you for, for having me, um, and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you.